This is a video covering my personal ownership and long-term experience with the 2020 BMW X7 M50i. I bought this to replace my Volvo XC90, which I had a lot of problems with, and then the deal breaker was it had a leaky roof. I also had a 2020 Lexus LC500, which was a perfect car, I just didn't drive it. I really, really loved that car, I wanted to own it, and then it sat in the garage through the winter, and then when the summer came, I was so, I'm was so i so busy with what I'm doing with this car career thing that I never got to drive it. And it really was a disappointment. I had so much money tied up into it. So the this vehicle was designed to replace both those. One is a camera car for track, lead follow, for road trips, for making videos when we go to manufacturers, and of course, just hauling equipment around and people. And I wanted a V8, and I wanted some of that character and sound uh, it's much like the LC500 had, this is nothing like that, but it's faster. It's, it's, you know, the engine is really solid. The transmission program is some of the best in the business. We beat that to death. So this combines those two cars for me. Is it a luxury purchase in some ways? Yes, which I did not buy this new. I got some money back on the XC90, which I event essentially evaporated in an aftermarket extended warranty for this. I got a 2020 model with about 15,000 miles and this was 85,000 or right around there. With the extended warranty and the maintenance plan that I got was another like $10,000, which is obviously uh, re refundable if I sell it. Um, this was spec'd out brand new at 120,000. That is maxed out. Rear inter rear entertainment package which you don't see the air freshener that has the cartridges for the HVAC, the Bowers and Wilkins, uh, it, obviously the air ride, it has adaptive sway bars, it has rear wheel steering, it has the 22 inch wheels, it has the blacked out package on the outside. It's basically every feature you can pack into X7 from 2020 is here. The other thing I wanted is I wanted the engine and transmission with the, without the hybridization. And I knew when I got this, the M60i was coming out where they have a mild hybridization on it. I didn't want that. This has the last iteration of their twin turbo V8 with all the technical updates. It's been one of the most reliable V8s in BMW history the transmission is essentially bulletproof so i was going into it thinking okay i'm hoping this is going to be solid and when you look at the exterior i did a video about the updated x7 so i can compare and contrast the way that new car looked versus this and i'm much more fond of the more traditional looking bmw exterior which this is it's not super exciting but it's very functional and with everything blacked out it, it's aged pretty well you know, you've seen a BMW a million times. I'm not going to talk about it. I've had zero problems with the exterior. If you're going into a higher end vehicle, you're going to expect a lot. Like, you know, this has night vision on it. It has the Pro Package Plus for or whatever the hell they call it for autonomous driving 2.5 hands free under 45 miles an hour in traffic. It has all those technology features here, which I'm going to start going over now. The interior space is something that has grown on me so much. When I got in here at first, I'm like, okay, it's a BMW interior. And then when you really use it, when you really start to use it, it's hard to go back to other cars. And the things that stand out to me is you have physical door handles. You have a proximity key system, you know, the key fob, which is, just looks like your traditional BMW thing. All I have to do is keep this in my pocket. And when I walk up 10 feet to this car, it's ready to go. Like I can walk in the garage and the car unlocks and it knows I'm there. I don't have pop out door handles. I don't have to hit the unlock key. I don't have to fuss around with like the modern shit where it never picks up your key. I essentially never have to unlock or unlock this car. It always knows when I'm ready to leave, including the ingress and egress part of this. The infotainment system is ready to go. The car's ready to boot up. There's minimal lag and delay. My phone always pairs up quickly. Android auto wireless and apple carplay wireless boots up almost instantaneously now i do a lot of profile switching which is one weak point like if you have different keys programmed or you have a lot of different people in and out of this car like i do it, it does get frustrating because you have a bunch of profiles for the phone and it prioritizes other ones but if you're not doing that like most people it's one of the best implemented pieces of like technology how things work and cohesively in terms of usability um Everything else feature-wise, depending on how you spec this, you know, when we get into the luxury features, it has heated heated armrests on the door and the center plane. It has heated and cooled cup holders on the in interior part here in the center stack, which are trash. They don't work. It's a total gimmick. The wireless charger is low output, so your phone barely charges and it superheats your phone where it's at. The, the utilization of center stack storage is really poor compared to other SUVs. This is more like a sedan. There's so much wasted space here. Um, but all the buttons are physical. 
I will say that that's the other thing I love about this interior space compared to the updated with versions with the iDrive 8. You have all physical HVAC controls with its separate screen. You never have to use the center screen unless you're turning on air conditioning in the back for people. That's the only time you have to interact with the, the infotainment to adjust climate. The uh, massaging seats on the door, the adjustability for the rear seats are on the door or physical. If you want to adjust the passenger side seat, somebody doesn't know how to do it, you push number two there and you can adjust their seat from the driver's side, all physical buttons. You know, that is where this generation of BMW is incredibly good. Everything works and is functional. Now, some of the tech features, obviously, like the stupid uh, proximity, like uh, touchless stuff where you use your finger for gestures, I have that off. The massage seat function in BMWs is worthless. It's nowhere near as good as what you get in the MDX and the Audi products, BM or I'm sorry, the Audi products and Mercedes products. That's one of the worst massaging functions if you're looking at it from luxury perspective. There are other things in here in terms of seat adjustability and the front seats are very comfortable. I have the individual leather package that you can get the seat however you want. I don't feel like it's the most comfortable seat on the planet. It feels a lot more firm than on other seats and then combine the fact that the seat coolers do not work in this car it's not a defect they just don't work passenger and driver you turn it on it just makes noise it doesn't suck it doesn't blow it doesn't serve its function seat heating does work great and most of the other technology stuff works good including iDrive 7 it's the perfect blend of technology that works door storage is amazing the door pockets are enormous you can fit any bottle in there and when you get to the back seats, I have the captain chair option, which I will tell you is, and I talked about this in my previous video, it's really, really painful. The seats are extremely comfortable. You can recline, you can adjust. They're like front seats in the back, but they're so slow. If you're getting in the third row, it's all electronic. It takes forever to move them. And the fact if you're moving car seats in and out, there's no traditional anchor point behind the seat. You have to bolt it to the floor in the back, which is the most frustrating part of this car if you're getting car seats in and out. You, you, if you're a shorter person, it's gonna be a struggle. However, there are a lot of anchor points in this car. In the third row, if you need tie downs and all that, they are really solid. The third row is basically pretty usable. It is comfortable and you have your own HVAC in the third row in the roof line. I, again, there's great use of technology, but the usability in the back is very, very flawed. You're gonna need the, the non-captain share version to uh, uh, kind of fix that. And the other thing that really pisses me off about this, which I didn't think about too much as a hauler, when I, I always have the third row down, but when I load this thing up the front two seats, the, the captain's chairs do not fold down. They go forward, but they not, do not fold down, and then you get an idiot light in here that they're they're not like you know they're not clicked in place. So it it really does sacrifice a lot of the usability of not having a second row that folds down flat, and that's something you're going to need to know. In terms of everything else, build quality is really good in here. I have the Alcantara headliner in here. It feels really high end. The la the dash is completely leather wrapped, unlike some of the Porsche shit where you have to spend like $160,000 to get a Cayenne with this level of like detail in it. And that's why you go to the BMW. You're getting a lot for your money in the interior in terms of feature set, that everything works. The, the materials are really good. It's pretty quiet in here overall. Uh, and the, the fit and finish has been pretty good. The only rattle I've really had is from the HUD in the front and it's really temperature dependent, but everything else has functioned flawlessly with the exception of the ambient lighting. There's a corroded connector that they had to replace to get the ambient lighting working on the bottom half of the car or the bottom half of the dashboard and in the back seats. But once they fix that, I've had zero problems with the interior space in here over 46,000 miles. I've been very, very happy with this. The last thing to talk about really is the technical stuff in the shop, and I'm gonna go over the running costs and the pain points of this and probably why I'm not going to keep this car and I wanna downgrade into something a lot more practical and sensible in terms of long-term ownership. But let's head into the shop now and talk about it. Before I talk about the technical things with the shop, I need to talk about tux mats. That's right, floor mats. You've seen videos before that we've done where we talk about the deadly nature of life inside of cars, such as meatball subs. You have just people going nuts in here. And when I bought the X7, it came with the BMW rubber mats and the regular floor mats. And like every single car, the coverage is pretty weak. Uh, I've had WeatherTech mats in other cars too, and it doesn't have like the wraparound coverage that Tux mats have. So when we started this partnership with them, 
and I put these in the car. I talked to one of the owners of the brand and he's just like, I had an X7 and you know, there's carpet everywhere, like really thick carpet. It doesn't take much to stain it. It doesn't take much to ruin it with salt. So when I switched over after one season to these, you can literally see how much a better job it does. And really that's the main thing. If you spent, if you're spending an ass load of money on a car that has a lot of carpet and not a lot of hard plastics, it's sad that you have to go to this level, but it's one of those things where it makes no sense not to protect your investment when you're in the hole for a big depreciation, depreciating asset like this. It really has helped the back seats and the front to protect the carpet from basically everything you're going to throw at it. And, and I'm really happy to have these in here. And if you're interested in these mats, you have a car that you really care about, check out their website. They don't have mats for everything, but they're going to have mats for a lot of things like this, a usable SUV. All right, let's talk about the tech stuff under the car. Underneath the 2020 BMW X7 M50i, just as a crash course, when this car launched, they had two drivetrain options, which was the B58 inline six, and of course the twin turbo V8 with the hot V setup. And this variation of the V8 had been around forever. And that's what I wanted. I talked about it in the interior why I wanted to go to the V8 version. And I chose the 2020 because they moved up to the M50i, which ditched the lower spec V8, which still had a lot of the technical updates, but they changed the twin scroll turbochargers on this to be a bit bigger. They changed the intake manifold on the M50i and they changed the cooling strategy along with making much more horsepower. So this is te technically the last update to this, this version of the V8 before they've moved to the S version, which is the pure M versions with the mild hybrid setup. So twin turbo V8, no mild hybrid stuff, and a ZF eight speed automatic transmission. It's the best thing that they've done. T typically the most reliable version of it. Granted, you know, when you put on over 100,000 miles, you better watch out. So in terms of my use over 45,000 miles, I have had no issues. I know that's strange. So I've had no complaints with anything to do with this vehicle. Now, however, I am taking it in because I am feeling the rear end of this car somewhat bind up in the back at slow speed. So I don't know if it's the diff. I don't know if it's the rear steer module or if it needs an alignment or what, but I'm taking it in so I don't know what's going on there yet, but it hasn't affected drivability other than that. But let's talk about the negative parts about this. This body structure is uh, largely a huge version of Klar. It's the maximum stretch version of it that you see on the five series, the seven series. It has, a steel front subframe and an all aluminum rear subframe. When you get to the X7 M50i or above, you get adaptive sway bars in the rear. You get rear steering, you get air ride, and all of this technology is basically maxed out in this upper trim level. And when it's all working well, it makes it feel very, very small. The ride quality is decent, for a BMW, it's still on the firmer side, even with air ride, it's nowhere near as good as the Audi equivalents, but they find a good blend between drivability and softness. So here are the things that you need to know about this that really suck. The consumable costs are absolutely insane, starting with tires. If you go to this fully optioned out, the 22 inch wheels or the 23 on the updated M60i, your tires are gonna cost a minimum of $650 per tire. And the winter tires are gonna be very, very similar. There's not a lot of options in this tire size. You basically have three or four tire options. They're all about the same. They're mostly Pirelli's. There's a run flat, non run flat, and there's a continental like all season, which probably is what you're gonna wind up doing uh, to be fair, but that's still an expensive tire. When you look at the other consumables like air shocks, they're air, air springs, it's $1,800 per air spring. Your rear, Adapt a sway bar, if that goes bad, or the motor goes bad, that's over $2,000. So just in suspension alone, you're looking at a potential of over $10,000 of cost if you have problems. The short block on this V8, which is no surprise, is around $30,000, which granted, unless you blow up an engine, you're gonna do individual repairs, but the engine parts are expensive for this, but again, you're gonna be doing component level stuff. The trans is only $10,000, and of course, that's probably gonna be a rebuild, and this trans is so common, you never have any issues with it. 
And then there's other little chicken shit stuff that you're going to have to deal with on a car like this in terms of bushings, electronics, all of that. But other than the brake calipers being very expensive, pushing over $2,000, the brake discs are actually pretty decent. Uh, they're a flat face rotor, so there's nothing like esoteric about it, but they're 200, a little bit over 200 a piece for rotors, which isn't bad in aftermarket, I'm sure is less. But surprisingly, there are some insanely expensive things that if you option this to the lower X7, much like the X5, you can get this and where you don't have the overhead of it, consumables killing you. But I'm gonna take this for a quick drive with Jack and we're gonna talk about the rest. All right, you wanna know why you buy an X7 with a twin turbo V8 Jack? Show me. To burn fuel, but more importantly, it impresses your uh, your neighbors. Hopefully, you find a couple single moms that need <laughs> extra transportation. <laughs> Jesus. That was just Sport Plus, no launch control, no traction control off, and obviously, there's different modes where you could <sighs> really do launch control and make this thing fly into the sunset, Jack. And we use this as a chase car on track where I used it to follow a drag race. And I think we did it for the Supra Z or the M2 or whatever, and this thing was flying. Yeah, it pulled away from me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, you know, that's one of the reasons why you choose this. And at the start of this video, I said, you know, this was replacing a three row SUV, the XC90 and my LC500. So I wanted, yeah, obviously, some type of blend of character between the two as a hauler and something fun. The reality is though, I never drive it fast. And it's like, okay, I merge on the highway and the fun's over. Because once you drive this like an absolute idiot, you're down into like 12 miles per gallon range. And this thing eats fuel with this big ass tank. You know, it's one of the reasons why personally I'm going to sell it. Yeah. It, it, it. The novelty of the V8 wears off very quick. And as much as you and I talk back and forth about just how amazing BMW's drivetrains are, whether it's inline six, their V8 products, they're next level. And I think part of the problem with BMW is what they were really good at is engineering, at least drivetrain stuff. And then they realize that's not enough to sell vehicles. And they're like, we got to hit them on the marketing. We got to make it look different. We got to do all the gimmicks. And now we're caught in this like weird place where now the vehicles are kind of like botched almost well, bmw isn't the brand that we grew up with anymore it's a, it, it's marketed to a different group it's meant for a different group and its core mission is far different than it used to be it was this idea of like purist you want a 911 but you can't have a 911 so you need a four-door you know enthusiast product with good driving dynamics you know you care about driving that's not bmw anymore but in the case of this X7, this is sort of that transitionary product to me, right? They haven't gone full like XM or IX with this product. This still has a lot of the good things that, why you love BMWs. Good drivetrain, excellent interior space for the most part, at least in the front, good ride quality. And as a long distance cruiser, we've taken this on a lot of our bigger projects. And this thing just eats up the miles. We talked to some engineers from Lucid and they even admitted that this is a three row, like long distance cruiser is one of their favorites. Yeah, and, and a lot of it has to do with the fact like, okay, here you are in the M50 or the X, M, M60, the rear steer shrinks down the size of it. Uh, it's ride control, it's body control, it's overall comfort, it's quietness is really, really amazing when you're looking at that 90 to $110,000 price range. And when you get on the highway, it's one of the things people are like, oh, why do you want to spend the extra money over like a Kia or an Acura? When you get above 100, which you're typically never going to do, honestly, but it's really when you're at that 100 plus, like 120, it feels like you're doing 80. There's such a level of isolation and control of this car that that's what elevates it above some of its competition. Namely, again, when you're talking about 100 something thousand, you know, you really, to get to that next level, you have to go to really high-end Cayenne, which is a two-row. Yep. You know, you have to go to really high-end level SUVs to, to kind of match There's some of this. There's a three-row that yeah. I can think of that we have driven that has the dynamics of this vehicle 
with also the luxury element. Like the big boy Range Rover, which we haven't spent any time in, but if it's anything like the prior gen vehicle, it's an excellent long distance cruiser, but when you start driving it hard like this, it completely falls apart. Not saying that this is some amazing driver's car, but you get the best of both worlds. The con is fuel economy. Yeah. Depreciation. Depreciation's horrible. And the running cost of this vehicle. You had an MDX Type S as a long termer for like six months to a year. Yeah. At the same time you had this, now in retrospect, now that the MDX Type S is gone, what would you rather have? I, I, I said this in the MDX video, if you have X7 money or Porsche money or like higher end vehicle money, you're gonna take this over that. But the thing is, this, one, one of the things that this doesn't do so well is BMWs, this generation, despite the drivetrain and how amazing they are, it always feels like you're riding on top of it. This feels like you're sitting on top of the suspension and it's isolating the, all the, the good stuff underneath from you. So you always feel like you're on top of it. It lacks directness, it lacks the quickness, like of the MDX Type S, where you feel like you're really connected to the front wheels the way that the car turns quickly. That vehicle may not have the ultimate grip and handling and, and performance this does, but it has a better connectivity to the vehicle. This just feels kind of boaty when you're on top of it. And it doesn't matter what drive mode you're in, even in comfort because of the tires, it always, it doesn't have the ultimate smoothness or softness that I would expect from a complete luxury boat. But when you go into sport, especially on the highway, you know, the damping really improves. Sport Plus is ridiculous. Like you could take this out on track, which I have taken it out on track just for the hell of it to see what it's like. It completely holds up braking system doesn't ever falter even despite the weight it gives you confidence and i didn't chew up any rotors or pads on this driving like a monkey compared to the xc90 where i could barely drive that thing and i trash rotors all the systems around this are great but it lacks something and i it's it's kind of the intangibility of trying to do everything to make this sporty to make it performance oriented to make it soft I, I don't feel like a lot of this is completely necessary, which is why the MDX Type S was great, because you can get a lot of what makes this good for far less money, far less running costs. Um, so I'm kind of like mixed on it. I don't think this is something that I would ever spend the kind of money I did on it again. I, I definitely would go down to a more practical three row vehicle or something, something. like a pilot. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, something just, I don't have to deal with you know, $120 fill ups and, you know, $2,500 in tire costs and, you know, all that shit is just, it really, really erodes away at the ownership experience for me. So, with that, Mark, let's head into the final thoughts, sir. Sounds good, Jack. Give me some good hate. Final thoughts on the X7. Overall, Great car. If you're looking for a luxury three row that has a ton of capacity with some serious compromises and seat design, depending on which trim you get, and something that delivers a high level of performance, drivetrain refinement, road isolation, great audio system with the Bowers, and a good interior space, namely on this pre-facelifted version of the 2020 or 2021, whenever they switched it over, I think you're going to be really, really happy for this if you know what you're, get, you're getting yourself into, which I talked a lot about during the, the drive and the interior segment. I think the reality is, are you getting a lot here for your money compared to some of the better three rows? And I think this is where the, the vehicle market and landscape has changed quite a bit because at least in North America, every vehicle keeps getting bigger, SUVs keep getting better and more luxury options the, the commodity brands have gotten way better at doing what this is doing. And if you're not looking for, you know, high levels of V8 performance and transmission performance, you're getting a lot from some of the sub brands that do, I would say 75% of this well, when you're just doing your daily commute. And that's the main thing. That's the, this is what this is. It's supposed to be a utility vehicle, a family vehicle. And unless you need that last level of performance and some of the things that the X7 gives you, you're just blowing your money. And that's one of the reasons why I want to flip it. I just feel like I'm just bleeding money with it for the luxury things that the BMW does well from this generation vehicle. But I'm very surprised at how good this is, how reliable it's been, and how pleased I've been with driving. It's going to be hard to go back to a normal, normal SUV after driving this. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next video.